Hey, listen, before we get started in this week's video, you know, I made one at one every week in 2010, and a lot of people commented that they had trouble watching them because they had a slow connection or they had dial-up. Asked me to put them on a DVD, and so I did. So it's 50-plus uh, videos on a two-set DVD for right now. We're, we're getting $13.99 for them. I had to keep them cheap because, you know, you can see them free on YouTube. So I just had to pay somebody to make the DVDs and off and run it. So you can click the link at the bottom of this YouTube video and learn more. Hey, thanks for watching another video from WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. Today's video is how to MIG weld. MIG welding is a very popular way to get started welding. And one of the reasons it's so darn popular is because it's just uh, really good for fabrication, for putting things together. You can hold the part with one hand and uh, use the gun with the other and prop the nozzle, get steadied up, and get tack welds on something without having to have a third hand or somebody helping you. So it's, uh, it's convenient, it's efficient, puts down a lot of wire, it looks good, very little cleanup, and it's, uh, it's pretty versatile as far as uh, positioning. So you can weld uh, you know, to all kinds of different thicknesses, uh, all the way down to really thin thicknesses like auto body panels with a little bit of adjustments, a little bit maybe a different uh, size wire, different gas, different technique. But uh, you can weld downhill, you can fill, you can fill gaps, you can weld uphill and stay under control. Just a versatile process, and uh, that's why it's so popular. And one little technique that I've found has been extremely helpful. Um, before I get, you can see it's even forgiving on gun angle. Going around in a circle like that, you're changing angles all over the place. But one little technique I've found helpful uh, for almost everything, you can just use it on pretty nearly everything, is this little thing here. It's a series of cursive E's. In your mind, actually, it doesn't have to be an E because with an E, you're looping back in the puddle. It can be just a series of U's, but um, it just works. It gives you a little bit of a metering device to move along at a steady speed. It, you can pause at the top to fill in any undercut. It gives you uniformity. It works for horizontal, flat, overhead. Uh, you can even use it downhill welding. If you want to speed up the, the uh, travel speed, just don't loop back into the puddle and you'll have less buildup. Just a series of U's instead of cursive E's. Even if you're welding uh, thinner sheet metal uh, downhill, just tighten the pattern up a little bit. Thinner the metal, the tighter the pattern until you're almost not doing any pattern, but, it, but you are doing just a little hint of a pattern and that keeps you moving at, at a steady speed uh, and it looks a little bit nicer than maybe sometimes just going along in a straight line, which you can do also. You can easily uh, just go in a straight line with MIG welding. It's just as the ripples look totally different and uh, just, just different techniques for different applications. Again, the thinner the metal, if you were doing auto body panel type thickness, you know, 030 or something, you just zip right along in a straight line about as fast as you can, or if you want to play the light and move just a little bit side to side, it kind of helps you see what's going on. So just whatever works for you. Moving in a straight line, I'm not worried about ripples in this case, this weld is going to be machined off anyway, but uh, one of the really popular way to get started with MIG welding for hobbyists is uh, just a 115 volt Lincoln. You see them in Lowe's and Home Depot all the time, and uh, that's a good hobby unit. A really good uh, light fabrication unit is a Millermatic uh, 250, 251, or 252. The old 250s I like that don't have the digital readout. They're really very bulletproof. But one problem with the 115 volt, in fact, a lot of them had been sold on Craigslist, is, is the polarity. You got to make sure it's on the right polarity. If somebody uses it on, uh, you know, bare wire, and then somebody else uses it on flux core, they they generally require different polarities. And the way you swap them is just swap the leads, like. You see one lead going to positive and one negative there. You just swap them. And in this case, this have the, there's a shunt, and it just changes position with the indicator on the uh, decal on the inside of the panel for, with positive and negative. And they all change polarity in different uh, kind of different methods, but the concept is basically the same. Bare wire MIG uses DCEP, electrode positive, also called reverse polarity, and most self-shielded flux cores use electrode negative. So I guarantee a lot of machines have been sold because they didn't run worth a crap because they were on the on the wrong polarity. Someone used the, they were set up for bare wire, somebody put flux core on them, and that self-shielded flux core just won't run well on the wrong polarity. 
So, all right, to the feeder mechanisms here. You got drive rollers with grooves in them that feed the wire through a cable. The torch has a cable in it that's kind of like a lawnmower, spiral wound steel lawnmower cable. And these drive rollers have a tensioner spring screw that, that provides tension on them that pushes that wire through the MIG torch. And they're adjustable and spring tensioning. And basically, they're all a little bit different, but then again, they're all a little bit the same. There's a little bit different mechanism, spring loaded to pop it up, swing arm over there, and uh, you tension it. Basically, if, if everything's right, if you have a good liner and no restrictions, uh, just use enough tension and a little bit more than just barely enough to push it through. And, uh, and more is not necessarily better in this case. If you have to really crank it down, you probably got something wrong. Dirty liner, clogged liner, whatever. Drive rollers come in all different uh, diameters for different size wire. There's also a tensioner on the bare wire, on the, on the wire spool. It's kind of like an anti-backlash thing on a bait casting reel. Keep it from uh, the inertia from keeping it rolling when you stop uh, welding. So it's kind of like a, keeps it from backlashing. You don't want a big bird's nest inside the cabinet with loose wire flopping all around. Again, that cable is like a lawnmower throttle cable. It's a spiral wound steel cable running, typically it is anyway, running through the length of the torch and you don't want to kink it. You want to have nice gradual looping bends so that it doesn't restrict the wire. Now on the business end, you got a contact tip and you got some ports for the gas to come out. That's called a diffuser and it gets spatter on it. And one of the best things, uh, cheapest things and most environmentally friendly things is just Pam cooking spray. We'll keep that spatter uh, at least where it cleans off easily. See spatter build up inside there, easily removed with some MIG pliers. MIG pliers, very handy design for this. You can use them even with the tip with it on the gun, but you got to keep that thing pretty clean or that spatter will, will uh, restrict the gas and also can eventually ground out, cause sputtering. So again, this is the diffuser with the ports where the gas, the shielding gas comes out. Typically, we're going to be using 75, 25, Argon CO2, you can also use straight CO2, but for thinner, thinner uh, auto body applications, 7525, definitely more friendly. And a little bit uh, a little bit less spatter, and there's not so quite so hard to adjust the machine, but CO2 works good too. I like my tip, my contact tip, flush or protruding a little bit. In fact, if, if it's not, I'll even take a ziz wheel out and trim that nozzle to where it is, because stick out is really important. If that thing's recessed way back up in there, uh, it's going to give me problems. And a lot of people like to weld with a recess and they make it work uh, to each his own. But for me, uh, having it flush or sticking out just a little bit, that's that's the way I can make things work. So so that's the way I do. When you're down inside a T-joint, it adds an extra, you know, three-eighths of an inch to your stick out if you've already got it sticking down in there. So, you know, that's my way of thinking anyway. Some of them are adjustable. They slip in and out. Some of them screw on. And there's not much adjustment. And then sometimes you have to buy a new, a different size nozzle or contact tip to get your right stick out. In this case, I just trimmed it. Now, when you pull the trigger on a MIG gun, a lot of things happen. The drive rollers start feeding wire. The current is initiated to get your arc and the gas starts flowing. And so a lot of stuff happens with that trigger pulling here. Now, how to set the machine. This, you can go to my website. There will be a link at the bottom of this YouTube video. It will have this chart here. This is a really good starting point for setting your machine. I won't go into it right now. Uh, how do you get practice? All right, just, you know, one thing I think is a really good way of getting practice is get some 3 16 or quarter-inch steel and prop it up uh, in front of you like this. Now, why in front of you instead of uh, laying down flat on the bench? Well, it's a lot more comfortable, and you don't have to breathe all those fumes. And really, it's not much more difficult, not really any more difficult than laying it down flat. In fact, it's probably a little bit easier because you're so comfortable. And just weld beads. Start off with the, setting the machine with that chart and just run beads. And run. I would recommend them running left to right and right to left, pushing and pulling, because that's the kind of stuff you have to do in, in, uh, with real jobs. Again, I'm using that little cursive E series of views type technique. Just a little bit, machine set just a little bit cold here, but after one or two beads, it gets really hot. And uh, so the first bead kind of almost needs to be a little bit cold. You can get a bucket of water. You can quench your, uh, your piece of metal every couple of beads. Not going to hurt it because you're not going to do anything with this piece of metal. So you're not worried about any, any uh, 
metallurgical problems on this. You can throw this thing in a scrap pile when you're done. So again, you don't even have to stop. You can just go back and forth, left, right, left, right, get that thing good and hot. It gives you lots of practice. It's up out of your way. You don't have to breathe all the fumes when you're like you would if it was laying right in front of you on a bench. And uh, you can fill this whole thing up with beads, get a lot of seat time, a lot of practice, practice setting the machine, tweak it to where you get a good smooth arc, sounds like bacon, and that's the way to get a lot of practice. You can also set up some joints like these lap joints for practicing, you know, downhill thin sheet metal. And uh, obviously anything you can think of will be good practice, but practice is what you need, seat time. You're not going to learn to weld in 10 minutes. This video is how to MIG weld, but obviously it takes more than 10 minutes to learn how. So go to the website, and I'm going to expand on this in weeks to come. Make your comments on what you'd like to see uh, as far as things I left out. Appreciate you watching. Visit WeldingTipsAndTricks.com.